Galima! Galima! <laughs> Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham. This is my good buddy, Ty Frank. We got to shoot through this one today because Ty has an important meeting with uh, a director. Do we say Spielberg? We don't. I can neither confirm nor deny that it is Steven Spielberg that I okay. meet with on a weekly okay. basis. Let's just say what we're doing today is really relevant. <laughs> uh, if you haven't noticed, but my... My art right there, which I think is the best poster of the indie movies, all three of them, which there's only been three. Yeah, thank you for pointing out that there have only been three. Just like there's only been two Terminator movies, there's only been two Alien movies, there's only been three Indiana Jones movies. There may be another Indiana Jones movie coming out, but depends when we watch it if it, if it comes out or not. Does yeah. that make sense? So yeah. after we watch it, we will decide if it's allowed to exist. If, in if this we want world. to immediately erase it from our memories. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, not only our memories, we erased it from existence. Yeah. We have that kind of power, just so you know, listeners. I, it, it's, it's a terrible burden to have that sort of power. <laughs> it is that kind of. So we're talking about Temple of Doom today. We, are, we did a long deep dive on Raiders, didn't we? We did. And this is the follow up. Now, before we get into this, I love this movie. I do too. I have incredibly <laughs> really? fond memories of this movie. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think that you would. No, so okay. this is this movie holds a special place in my heart because so I grew up, in, as you know, in a in a crazy religious abusive fundamentalist. Home. It's not yeah. abusive, but well, yeah. sometimes. But mostly it was <laughs> mostly it was fundamentalist. They touched you. I get it. Go ahead. Fundamentalist evangelical craziness. And so a lot of things were like, you know, you weren't supposed to go see R movies. You weren't supposed to like anything that had the smack of spiritism in it. You because, you know, you were inviting demons into your home if you, if you had that kind of stuff. Anyway, so the way that your mom had a major hard-on for Tom Selleck. Right. My mom had a major boner for Harrison Ford. Yeah? Like, a, the, a major boner for Harrison Ford. So, she broke all of her own rules <laughs> if, if Harrison Ford was involved. She broke the Lord's commandments. She broke the Harrison Lord's commandments Ford for Harrison involved. Ford. Yeah. So, like... Like the the one R rated movie I remember my mother ever watching was Blade Runner because it had Harrison Ford in it. Right. And she and my father went and saw Raiders of the Lost Ark. And then later she was like, Oh, this movie's great, you have to go. So she took me to see it. And I think it just gave her an excuse to watch it a second time. Like I think she just wanted to watch it twice. So she took me to see it. And I lo- you know, I loved the first Raiders. It was amazing, right? So a couple of years later, when Temple of Doom comes out, I'm, I'm sitting, in, I think I was in junior high when this came out. I'm sitting yeah. in class. And you're like, Mom, Harry's got a movie out. <laughs> no, no. So they, they call for me on the, you know, the little uh, PA thing. They're like, oh, uh, get Kutai. the fuck they, they, out Kutai, of here. Frank, come to the principal's office. I'm like, fuck, what did I, I haven't, I haven't done anything I can remember. They, that right? is the so greatest I, fucking, go ahead. That's amazing. So I go to the principal's office. And my mom's there. And I'm like, oh, shit. I'm, I don't know what has yeah. happened. I don't know what I did. They found the I'm weed in my fucked. locker. Yeah. I'm fucked, right? My mom's filling out a thing that, like, she's taking me out of school. She, that, you know, she has, like, an important family thing she has to take me out of school for. And I was like, what is going on? So I get in the car, and we're driving, and we drive past the road where we would turn to go to our house. So I'm like, I'm not saying anything because I'm, I'm worried if I say anything, I'm going to be in trouble. Right. Like if I say anything, she's going to be like, she'll unload on me, whatever shit I just got into. Yeah. You got caught jerking off the bathroom. (laughs) (laughs) Again, (laughs) we pull into the movie parking lot and I'm like, what is happening right now? Right. And she goes, the new Indiana Jones is out. I thought we should, I thought we should go see it on. We we went and saw it on opening day, the matinee showing. Yeah. That's a double orgasm, right? Yep, Your mom's was, taking you out of school early, and then you're going straight to the movies to watch Temple of Doom. And the thing is, this movie has a lot of like what my parents would have considered spiritism because uh-huh. it's got like the Kali thing, and he's pulling the yeah. guy's heart and all that stuff. And I kept waiting for her to get up and leave because right. that was that was their move. Is like if they watched a movie and there was questionable stuff in it, they would they would force every force all of us to get up and leave. She never did. We sat through that whole movie. She watched the whole thing. Harrison Ford overpowered her religious convictions. She was, she was willing to go to hell for Harrison. What's your mom's name? Uh, Gail. Gail, just like that, you totally redeemed yourself. You raised my buddy, my good buddy Ty in a religious cult, but then you take him to see Temple of Doom, and I forgive all your sins from the past. <laughs> <laughs> so, so because of that, I have nothing but fond memories of having seen this movie. Okay, so I must be mistaken because I thought that you didn't like this movie. Now, maybe it's Brett 
and we'll get to the problematic stuff. We'll get to the problematic stuff later. Well, I was going to say, objectively, it is the weakest of the three, objectively. But subjectively, I saw it when I was in junior high by skipping school, so it, it overcomes all of that. I'm going to push back against that a little bit. Uh, it, you know, I don't have much ground to stand on, but I have a little bit of ground to stand on. Particularly, you have no ground to stand on. Did he just? Did he just snarl at us like a? It, pig? Sound, it sounds like he came out of hell. There was like yeah. howling and like yeah, growling like a, and like a hog. gnashes of teeth. <laughs> and he it was like a big thing. hog. Oh, then it must have been Joseph that didn't like Temple Doom, and I and I think Brett. But you know, like it's really popular in my movie nerd friend circles when they uh, to bash Temple of Doom, you know. And so for me, the first movie I saw in the theater was Return of the Jedi. It was in 83. The second movie I saw, I was five years old. I remember I was going, uh, I was staying with my dad and it was summer and he always take me to see movies. And we went and saw Temple of Doom in the theater. And I, and I think I might, maybe I, it's hard to remember. Maybe I saw it even before Raiders. No, I must not because I was, you know, obviously excited to go see it. But anyway, I go see it. I was five years old. It blew me out of the theater. And one of the details that this movie had that really drew me in is Short Round. I loved Short Round and he was a point of view and an entry point for me. Like how often do would did we would I dream about like being able to go along with Indiana Jones, you know, in as a five year old kid and like help him out on his adventures. And so I was a huge fan of Short Round and I, I watched it recently I watched it today to prepare for this. And Keith Kwan is a hell of an actor. He's a very good actor for that for for his age. And by the way, all the kids in this, the kid that was exhausted coming out of the desert when they're in the village, oh, he's yeah. like, I was like, Jesus Christ. It was yeah. so terrifying in the theater to see that and like, what are they doing to these kids? But anyway, I, I won't jump ahead. But I my experience was so complete. And it was, it's, I mean, it's one of the, the movies that I went and saw, one of the experiences that made me fall in love with this, with the movie experience. And I had, and I remember laughing my ass off. Like the humor just really worked for me at that age. And, and I, I went through the whole spectrum. See, you're making a lot of subjective arguments. I was saying objectively, Temple of Doom is the weakest of the three, but I think our subjective experience can make it better, worse than that. And think of the movies you're comparing it to. So like if, if Raiders of the Lost Ark is an A plus and Last Crusade is like an A minus, we're talking about Temple of Doom as a B, which still makes it better than 95% of movies out there. Right. But so there's other ways to get credit, right? There's other. And so I was, yeah, I was still in the subjective mindset, but if I'm going to do my objective argument, one of the things that I would say objectively is, so you make Raiders of the Lost Ark and it is one of the top four biggest movies of all time. Second to Star Wars, Jaws, and E.T. <laughs> These motherfuckers are wizards. Like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas is a wizard. I'll take it just a side note. You know, sometimes if I talk about a director and when a movie was made, I'll, I'll like list, I'll like talk about the run that they were on and be like, this is what they made at this time. You can't do that for Spielberg because you're going to, you're just going to keep listing names for four decades. Like every yeah. thing that he's had his hands on is gold. It's magic. These guys are, yeah, they his spin IMD, magic. His IMDB page <laughs> is just a list of the most successful movies ever. Ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I like, mean, that's just me, his IMDb yeah. page. Yeah, and and you know, like him and Lucas, like they formed me just as much as my parents with their movies. Like their movies, like Star Wars and 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 any anything. Anyway, so you make this you make this first movie, right? You're going into your second sequel, the second sequel that Spielberg has ever done at this point, and. I think they went a little punk rock. I think that George Lucas was in his dark period. I think he just finished Empire. He was going through a brutal divorce, um, and he was in a bad mindset, and they channeled this mindset. Spielberg was going through a bad breakup, and I come to learn later, and I didn't know at this time, that horror is one of my favorite genres, and being able to say, what would it be like if, if Indiana Jones was in a horror movie? And uh, the fact that they didn't hug the formula that made the movie successful and just rearrange the parts and have the same payoffs and same things and same evil guys. The fact that they made a big swing and put it in a different tone in a different world. To me, you get a little points for that. And because it worked and maybe it was because I was a child and it was one of my first ma major movie experiences, but it worked for me. Then I, I, I elevate that a little bit more. Now, Last Crusade, objectively, from movie-making standards, is a 
is is I would say a better made movie. It's better written, but it is also just a rejiggering of parts that made the first movie successful. In some ways, when the Raiders hit, when I when I Raiders came across my radar and I saw it, I, I'd never seen anything like that. This is before I saw the African Queen, or the Treasure Sierra Madre, or any of those, and I've never seen, and it, it floored me. It was an experience, and then I see Temple of Doom, and it's something new, and it's, and I mean, they're ripping motherfuckers' hearts out, <laughs> fucking throwing them in lava, and, and you're like, dude, this is a worthy opponent, and we'll get to the problematic stuff later, but this is a worthy opponent for Indiana Jones, and, and also, I think that it's, because it, this is a prequel, this came before Raiders, yeah. and I think it's a fuller character arc. So who Indy is in the beginning of Raiders is who he is at the end of this. And he's way more cold-blooded in this. I mean, he puts a fucking fork knife to Cape Catshaw and takes a hostage when he's in the village. And they're like, yeah, they're stealing our children and everything. But he finds out that the stone, that, that's not enough for him to go. But he finds out the stone and he's like, fame and fortune. And then he goes and I'm like. Fortune and glory. Or fortune and glory. Yeah. And I see that and I'm like, this motherfucker, this is not the, the you know, I mean, he, there's a little taste of that in the other one, but this is like full anti-hero, right? I, I think he has a fuller arc. I think there's more edge to this movie than m- probably any Spielberg movie in the 80s. There is a bit of, of darkness that runs through it like Empire Strikes Back. And so in terms of, you know, the, drinking blood and demonic cult and zombies and shit like that i'm just into it i just i i and you know i i really in, enjoyed that so i would say i i struggle because when raiders came out it was like a brand new pure pure thing they didn't even really know how to market it it was kind of a stealthy marketing campaign it came out it crushed everything then temple of doom they're like we're taking a big swing we're doing something dark we're doing something different tone so that was kind of a new creation that i respect crusade was like it was almost like the fun house for it was like the you know the the disneyland like all the the promotion you know you can get cups at mcdonald's with the thing on it and you know it was all the and 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 they just made such a big deal about indiana jones and and it was almost like it, it was it was a bit derivative for me it wasn't as pure even though it, they hit all the notes they did all the things and you watch it and it's a you know again it's we're talking about a plus or <laughs> a uh just under a plus I, it's it's funny. It's it's like listening to somebody talk about how they loved a band until the band got popular. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, but I think they uh, got got popular as soon as they came out. I, I'm not going to disagree with anything you said. I agree. I love the horror aspect of Temple of Doom. I love I love the this darker version. You know, this sort of the Empire Strikes Back tone that it has. Of this is a darker Indiana Jones. It is a is a more mercenary version of indiana jones he's not he's not there to save the world or do good he's there because as you said he wants fortune and glory and we see him change through the course of this i agree with all of those things the problem i think is when you watch it as an adult which i rewatched it just a little while ago tonally it is a bit of a mess because you have this dark horror sort of story going on and the, this is also a, it's, it's married with a very cartoony tone, which the first movie didn't have. The first movie had, had humor. It definitely had some funny moments, had a lot of funny moments, but it never got cartoony. And what I find very strange about the second film, and, I, and I, I'm going to repeat that I love this movie, so I, this is not me explaining why I don't like the movie. I love the movie. But what I find very odd about the movie when I rewatch it in one direction, they went more cartoony than the first movie with like when they jump out of the airplane with the like the raft or when they're eating the guys swallowing the snake or like there's all these kind of weird cartoony stuff. And then that's also married to this very dark horror tone with like, you know, like this guy with mystical powers to pull people's hearts out and sacrifice them to lava gods. And I mean, like, like those two things, they're too far apart from each other for me to be in parallel like it just you feel like you're getting yanked back and forth between silly cartoony stuff and then a guy getting his heart pulled out and thrown into lava that to me a bit of a tonal mess yeah and that's what i'm saying it's like the the first movie and the third movie were very very tonally consistent they're very well written movies Mm -hmm. and very well directed movies now the second movie is very well directed because it's fucking steven spielberg and he's never shot anything badly in his life right 
Like I'm sure when he was 11 and he was using his Super 8 camera, nope, all, of his, all of his shots were amazing. Oh, nope, brilliant! <laughs> Every one of them. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, if they, if they like, if 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 one day they were like uh, his his old house got torn down and they fall and they found this old like rolled up celluloid and a and a and a reel that he made when he's five years old. If they dust that off. And fix it up, put it on. It's another fucking blockbuster. It's, it's another blockbuster. Yeah, <laughs> another I, I agree. Blockbuster. Yeah, no, the guy's never <laughs> shot anything badly in his life. I don't even think he knows how to shoot something badly. So, you know, it's tricky when we do shows like this because there's three ways to revisit a movie. There's one way where you want to communicate and relive the first experience when you watched it at the mindset at the, how, you know, I was five years old. And then there's the way to kind of go back and review it within the context of the time and place that it was at, right? But as an adult and, and looking at it as somebody that's, you know, seen a lot more movies since then. And then there's the review of you now with all of the, the knowledge and the movie taste and everything you have now going back as if you're watching it for the first time and reviewing it in the context of now and looking back on it. And so... In things like these, like Temple of Doom, for you and for me, because it was such a magical experience in our lives, it's hard to separate from that nostalgia. Right? Sure. And yeah. so people, you know, we can talk about the, the things that, you know, people would say that are kind of against it. And that cartoonish tone combined with the horror tone in today, I look back and I'm like, I see your point. I see what you're saying. But when a kid who is like, you know, not done watching cartoons but also is like discovering his love of horror and action and everything like that. It just talked straight to me. You know, sure. it just, it yeah. just hit and me when right. I, when I was a kid and watched this, I didn't notice the, the cartoony stuff didn't jump out at me. Yeah. It made me laugh. <laughs> and I still, I laugh when I rewatched it, but there's two scenes that made me laugh hard. Number one, when Indy, uh, after he gets the rocks and he hears the kids wailing and he goes and looks over and that big bodyguard who was the guy he fights in the um, first Indy at the World War II plane, big uh, soldier with the beard. Yeah. And, and then he's like, motherfucker. And he grabs a rock and just pings it off the back of his head. <laughs> and it's like, it's just such a like, he's, it's like, and he's like, you know, just this like hero and capes and uh, whips and everything. And he just this one thing, he's like, motherfucker takes a rock and just wails it on his head i thought that was great and then the uh and i don't know why this is funny to me but it's funny is when his foot's about to burn off because he's stopping the trolley and he's like water water and then he looks up and this big like and then the thing of the water comes and he (laughs) turns around so anyway in saying that i i was scared i was swept up in the action and i laughed my ass off and so, you know, maybe the target audience kind of skewed younger. But in saying that, I get your points as an adult looking back in retrospective and watching this film. And I guess we should probably talk about all the, the problematic nature of the movie um, as we go forward. You know, the one thing that, you know, I understand the criticism of the movie is when she was crazy about the diming and the, the, the screaming and the... You know, um, and, you know, she seems to be kind of a gold digger in the beginning because she's with that guy. The, the real tragedy of, of Kate Capshaw's part in this movie is, it, for me, it's less about the depiction of women. It is more about they just don't give her anything to do. Like, the only thing she does is shriek. And that's too bad because I think Kate Capshaw is better than that. I think, I think you could have given her something interesting to do, and I think she would have been good. But the one thing that works really well, and this reminds me of the African Queen, is and I think her and Harrison Ford have a, do it very well. I love that tension where you kind of hate each other, but you really want to fuck each other, <laughs> and, it's, and it goes back and forth all all through the movie. And I think they do that, yeah, really I mean, well. Yeah, they, he finds her annoying, she finds him annoying, but she looks like Kate Capshaw and he looks like Harrison Ford. So of course, <laughs> exactly. of course, you want to fuck. Yeah, I, I I I will say that the 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 thing that really, the one thing that really bugs me in this movie is how little she is given to do and how much all of her scenes just turn into her shrieking indie. And I think it would be less glaringly obvious if the first movie hadn't had Ravenwood. Yeah, exactly. The first movie had such a great heroine in it who was, who was in many ways indie's equal and indie's, you know, partner and, and he could rely on her and she and she, you know, if she got captured, she was getting herself out of being captured. Right. She was 
she she had her own agenda and, and her own strength and then we don't have her now and now we have this shrieking character who never successfully accomplishes anything for herself is constantly requiring being saved and her main job yeah but her main job when you compare that to the first movie yeah. it's just such it's so glaringly different that i think that's why a lot of people latched onto yeah. it yeah i think her her main job is the comedic relief and you know ravenwood was initially supposed to be in this movie when they yeah. thought it was going to be a, a natural sequel and i really wonder what Temple of Doom would have been like with Ravenwood and, and how that would have came across. Marion, Marion would have been, a, yes, it would be a very different movie. Mm-hmm. But I think, I think Marion in this movie, I, I would love to visit the alternate universe where that's the movie that got made mm-hmm. because I would love to see what that looks like. Right. And, and then, you know, like the other problem with the film is how they depict Indian culture in yeah. the film. Now is I I didn't research this, but is is this all a fictitious? I know it was uh, heavily influenced by Gunga, Gunga Din. Did you ever see Gunga Din, the the Cary Grant movie? Yeah, yeah. I mean, dude, it's this movie bar- borrows heavily from Gunga Din, right? Yeah, and and there was even the uh, the uh, what's the name of the cult? The Thuggy, the Thuggy cult. Yeah, the thuggy that's cult, a real the that's thuggy. a real thing. That's a real cult. So I don't have a problem with demonic cults i don't have a problem with you know uh century old underground demonic cults where they're drinking blood out of skulls and everything like that but if it's kind of like falsely portraying something that doesn't that doesn't truly exist um then you're gonna have a problem like i can watch texas chainsaw massacre and i and and i watch that and i'm like wow this is just a crazy family i don't think Every family in Texas is like that, you know, but the problem comes in and, and I'm not, I'm not looking to bash the movie, but the problem comes in when a, uh, another culture is put on screen and it seems entirely for the purpose of laughing at them, which a lot of scenes with the, the, the Indians are intended to be humorous just because, Hey, look at these, look at the crazy shit. These weirdo Indians do. Let's laugh at it. That is, I think, the the main complaint. You know, like the whole dinner scene where like, oh, they're eating bugs and snakes. Look how weird the Indians are. I agree with you. Everything, you know, that where you're laughing. But the thing about when they're having dinner and they're eating the the eels and the you know, all the gross stuff, I didn't look at that as like, oh, these are Indian people. I looked at that like as like, oh, this there's something wrong with it. This is an ominous sign of what these people are. There's something underneath that's, that's evil. Well, well uh, that that would work, except that not everybody in that room is a member of the thug, thuggy cult. Who's like most not? of the people? Most of the people at that table are not thuggies. They're just local Indian dignitaries eating with the important man who lives at Pancock Castle. Oh, see, I I didn't follow that through because yeah. I knew that the, there's a the British officer there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So most most of those people were not members of the thuggy cult, and they're still portrayed as. These oh, laughable well, well, then this, I yeah. then I support the criticism for it. This is the inherent danger in nostalgia filmmaking. So you're right. Gunga Din is like a huge influence on this. And the other thing that they've always said from the very beginning is that this was largely the the Indiana Jones universe is largely based on the serials that George Lucas grew up watching. You know, he would go to the movies and they always had the little short film, the like the the adventure film or the Buck Rogers or the Flash Gordon, you know, there was always that little serialized short film. And, and the Indiana Jones movies are heavily, heavily based on George Lucas's memory of watching those serials, right? Which, you know, that's, that's fine. That's great. The problem is that if you're not conscious of all of the biases that were present in that previous period, and you replicate that period without being aware of the biases that were baked into it, you wind up replicating the biases. And I think the mistake that Temple of Doom makes is those movies always had the crazy local culture and, and they were they were you know they were they were funny and we would laugh at them because they're they look at their weirdo ways. Oh, they're wearing grass skirts, that's funny. And if you're not consciously aware of that and you're just replicating the thing that you remember wind up making something that has all the same racism as the 20s version which yeah. you know by the time we get into the 80s we should probably be a little better than that um and i think some of that is in this now i don't think 
I don't think the whole movie is like a whole racist screed because obviously the, the initial village that Indy comes to, they don't make fun of those guys. The initial mm-hmm. village where the, the elder asks them to go save the children, they're, mm-hmm. they're, those guys are not there to be a subject of fun. Yeah. Right? It's not until we get to Pankop Palace that suddenly the Indians are like this goofy culture and we're making fun of them. So it's, it's a weird mix. Again, again, it's kind of tonally a mix, which are tonally a, a mess to me, which is, is, is my main criticism. By the way, another reason that I love uh, this film is I think Harrison is at peak handsomeness. This is the Mount Rushmore of Harrison Ford ha- handsome. Uh, you know, convince me otherwise. No, no um, I, I, I think the, the test that we can use to prove your thesis is that in spite of all the spiritism and hearts being pulled out of chests yeah, and violence and all that stuff, my mother did not leave that theater. My yeah. mom sat through that entire movie, so yeah. I, think, I think we have proven your thesis correct. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think like he was approaching the summit with Raiders, right? He was yeah. on the summit of peak handsomeness. The beginning was uh, the opening in Empire Strikes Back, right? You're getting up to the summit. Then you do Raiders, and you're almost there. Temple of Doom, you are at the top of the mountain of handsomeness. And, and he's jacked in it. Like, he's, he's, oh, Harrison Ford was lifting some weights before this one. Oh, Indy, in his early days, you know, when he's all sweaty with his shirt off in the, yeah. in the uh, temple, and you're like, wow, oh, Indy, he's... I, I bet I can see old Gail having feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you when, in that opening sequence, and I really enjoyed the whole round table bit. It felt very James Bond. It felt betrayal. It's it obviously really well directed, really well written. It's a great situation. But when he takes that flaming shish kebab and harpoons that guy in the table, yeah. it's such a dark murder and so different than the other and kind of And it's just straight up a murder. <laughs> and it's straight up a murder. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost, I mean, they poisoned him, but it was almost like, oof. And he, the guy's like, ah, and he's shooting the gun. And I'm like, whoa, I am, I am here for the ride, baby. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I, we've talked about the, the criticisms we have. So, yeah, I think it's a good time to talk about all this stuff we love, right? And we were talking a little bit of the prologue, but I love, I love, like, Raiders is obviously the, the apex mountain of prologues and movies. <laughs> but I love this, too. Like, I love the way they start these indie movies where you're finishing up another movie and, yeah. you know, and you're, you're getting a glimpse of what happened in that movie. And then they wrap that movie up so you get to see the ending of another movie and then begin anew going forward. By the way, did you notice that it was Obi-Wan? The, the club they were at in the beginning in Shanghai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a famous Easter egg. Yeah, yeah. the Obi-Wan. We meet Short Round. They make their escape. They get on the plane. And did, did you know, I didn't know this. It, reading about it, it went back. But did you know that was Dan Aykroyd? That's like, hey, hey, you know, how are you doing? And like, gets him out and he says, your plane's ready, Mr. Jones. And they're walking through the crowd. God, I do not remember that. <laughs> that was Dan Aykroyd. Man, I have, no, I have no memory of that being Dan Aykroyd. I just saw the movie just a little while ago. Yeah, wow. so Dan Ack, when he goes, I owe you a gin, before he gets in the plane, and he's saying, I owe you a gin, that's Dan Aykroyd that he's talking to, which is fucking awesome. And you go back and look at him, and you're like, it's Aykroyd, and they don't cut in on him. They don't, there's no close-ups or anything, it's just fucking Aykroyd showing up. And uh, I, think, I think this is pretty soon after 1941, um, so Spielberg and him had that relationship. And the crazy thing about that Easter egg is nobody mentions it, nobody talks about it. But you go back yeah. and you look, and you're like, that guy's kind of, is that Dan Aykroyd? And, I mean, you have to rewind it to see, but it's Dan Aykroyd in the, uh, in the I, thing. Is, is Spielberg per, put Dan Aykroyd in his movies in funny ways sometimes? Because, I mean, Dan Aykroyd shows up in, two, in the frame story for Spielberg's um, Twilight Zone movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But he's only in those two bits. He's only in the, the opening bit and the ending bit. Yeah. yeah. I feel like there's, oh, the Crystal Skull comes from Dan Aykroyd. He's like obsessed yeah. with these crystal stoles. And like, he has a crystal it, skull yep. vodka, which I think is really, really interesting. Now, this, even as a kid, this is, when it's, this is when Temple of Doom starts to leave me a little bit. Just for a little bit. Just for a brief sequence. Okay, first thing. Uh, so we discover that the guy he's running from, it's his cargo plane that he's getting on. Uh-oh, yes. they're in trouble now. So Indy goes asleep. They're all asleep. Why would you not shoot them and throw them out of the plane while they're sleeping? Why would you fly over the Himalayas and jump out in a parachute and leave them with the plane to crash? 
Yeah. There's well, so many aren't, other ways. Aren't you going to gonna land them. in your parachute in the Himalayas? <laughs> in the Him- <laughs> Where the fuck are you going? Where are dude? you going? <laughs> Where are you going? You should have thought this through. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> right? hey, yay, we made it out of the plane, but now we're fucking 7,000 feet up the side of a mountain in the Himalayas. Somebody, somebody should do a short film of like them <laughs> of those, landing. Of those guys. <laughs> of those guys. Like they land, they're rolling up their parachutes and like, ha ah, they're high five. We got them. We got them. And then they kind of slow the smile. Just from, they look around, look around. And they're, 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 it's like, what the fuck do we do now? And then cut through their frozen, like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. Yep. <laughs> um, and their plan does not make a lot of sense. <laughs> their plan does not make a lot of sense. And the second thing that doesn't make sense is let's get on an inflatable raft. Now, look, it's Indiana Jones, and I'm willing to make huge leaps of faith, huge leaps of faith. But you're dropping out of an airplane, out of the sky, in an inflatable raft, and that's going to save you? <laughs> like, that's going to... And the raft is, like, falling perfectly, like it's not flipping over? It would immediately flip over. But but this is what I'm talking about, where it crossed the line into cartoony. You know, like, Indiana Jones does unbelievable stuff, and we're here for it, right? We love when he does unbelievable stuff, because he's fucking Indiana Jones. He, he rode a submarine across the ocean, to get to the Nazi secret <laughs> right. base on the I'm, periscope. I, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But the raft crossed the line into cartoon. It, it crossed did. the line. And then yeah. they fall into the mountains and then it turns into sledding thing, which yeah. again is, is, is like, okay. It, it's not as cool as when Willow and, um, and yeah. Val Kilmer, but when did they get to the equator? Like they're in the Himalayas and within seconds, they're now in like a sweltering hot place where people are, are not even, people are wearing robes, you know? And like, yeah. the geography is a little muddled. <laughs> the geography is, yeah, yeah. I mean, unless that was like a really fast raft or really fast river going down there, you know? That part just feels like it's, it's part of the, the adventure story kind of thing that people rapidly get to the next place. So that, that doesn't bother me as much. The raft out of the airplane feels very cartoony. Uh, the sledding down the side of the mountain feels very cartoony. The fact that they quickly wind up in like equatorial India. I, I'll, I'll give them a pass on that one. I'll give them a pass I, on that. I'm not passing yet, but because <laughs> that, that bummed me even as a kid, that kind of yeah. bummed me. I was like, I, wait a minute. I thought they were in the snow and then everybody's like sweltering. Everybody's sweating and their things are open and everything. And they're in the, you're, um, in the you're like, uh, what was, uh, what was the character's name? Uh, misery. Han Solo. Annie, Annie Wilkes. <laughs> Annie Wilkes, yeah. You're like, Boink. yeah. She's, uh, she, got, she got so upset when the, uh, the adventure serial didn't play fair. <laughs> <laughs> now, what did you think of the setup? And what did you think of the introduction of the MacGuffin? We want to get to it quickly. We don't want to screw around. They show up at the village. The village is all fucked up. Indy's talking to the elder. He says, we're fucked up because they stole all our kids and they stole our, our magic stone. That's fine. Let's get to it. Let's get going. Yeah, I'm okay with it. But as far as MacGuffins go, I think the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant are way more interesting and compelling than a rock. Well, but but they're also one of the things I respect about this movie is the spiritual mythology of Indiana Jones, which is that things that are magical do exist isn't just a Judeo Christian one. It's not just the Ark of the Covenant, which was a Jewish artifact. It's not just, you know, the, the Goblet of Christ, which is a Christian artifact. But the gods of, the, of India, their artifacts have magic power, too. So, like, that's a good point. Is the rocks an actual thing, or are they making something up? Because it would be kind of fucked up that they would use I, actual know, I, things. I honestly don't know, although Indian mythology is incredibly... I mean, they've, they've got thousands of gods. Right. And tons of mythology, tons of mythology about uh, the interactions of those gods and stuff. I I would guess that there's probably something like this in the mythology somewhere. Right. You know, these blessed stones that bring prosperity to the people who have them. I'm guessing that's probably true because fucking everything is in Indian mythology. So I'm guessing this is probably in there somewhere. Right. Too. Uh, by the way, I'm saying Indian mythology. What I'm meaning is Hindu mythology because not all Indians are Hindu. So I, I want to I want to clarify because I was saying the wrong thing. Yes, in Hindu mythology, there's thousands of gods and there's all of this stuff. Not all people in India are Hindu, so I shouldn't make those, I shouldn't conflate those two things. The one thing Spielberg does very well, because child actors can take you out of the story sometimes. 
right? Yeah. Because if they come on, you know, like we we did, we just uh, talked about Outland. Outland, like Outland yeah. was like the kid, and I'm like, this could have been a great speech. But one thing Spielberg, well, of the many things that Spielberg does well is he's very good with directing children. I mean, if you go back and watch ET, you're like, Jesus, he should, you know, he should have won an Academy Award. Henry Thomas should have won an Academy Award for that. But this kid comes in, and I'm like, I believe that this kid is. There's some scary shit going down. Like this is everything. And what I thought was interesting is like, okay, they stole our magic rock, and now we have famine, and our rivers are drying up, and we're all dying. Oh, by the way, they stole our kids, and they're doing child and you know stole our magic rock. And he's like, eh, okay. he stole our kids. Eh. <laughs> but then he finds out that the rocks are what, what's the name? Like the official name of the rocks? Yeah, the uh, Ankara stones. Yeah, the Ankara. He finds out that they're the Ankara stones. And uh, and he and he realizes like fortune and glory, and they have that great scene with him in short round. And they're over the st- and you see the shooting star, and they're out there in the space. And apparently, I think Spielberg always has his trademark as a shooting star in his movies. But they're sitting there, and it's a great shot. And he's standing over, and he stands up, and he's like, you know, he's basically stating his motivation of why he's going forward, and it's fortune and glory. And that bumped me. I don't remember being bumped as a kid, but it bumped me like Jesus Christ, and they got child slaves over there. You're not going to save them. Like, oh, fortune and glory? This was a much more mercenary Indiana Jones. Yeah, he's he's much more of a mercenary than he is in Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I think uh, goes to support your thesis that the, we, in this movie, we're watching him become the Indiana Jones right? that we see in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And what's interesting is in the first Raiders, when Belloc says, you're not much different than me. There's a thin line between us. Yeah. And we know it because Indy kind of falls on the other side of the line every now and then, you know? Yep. And in this one, he's clearly in Belloc territory. Yeah. He starts, he line. starts out as another Belloc. And by the end, he's, he's gotten better. He's, he's like more, he's doing yeah. things for the right reasons by the end, but he doesn't start out there. No, he doesn't start out there. And I think that anti-hero complexity works very well in Indy. If he's headed in the right direction with his morality arc. Yeah. And then, you know, so so then they have the whole elephant journey and everything. But I will say during that journey, getting to Pancock Palace, one scene that works well. Right. So I, I think now it's dated with her screaming and running around, you know, and all that. But one thing that I think works really well is when him and Short Round are playing poker at the fire and she's being tormented by all these animals in the jungle. And she's like, ah, ah, and they're arguing over. They're like totally not even paying attention. And, and, and they're like, you cheated me. And he's like, I didn't cheat. And then you see Short Round has an ace and they're both cheating each other. Right. And they're both like going back and forth. And like I quit, quit and just completely unaware of what she's doing. I, I thought that worked really well. And that, that still makes me laugh. It is a funny scene. It is a little, it, it's again, it's a little for me edging over into cartoony, but yeah, it, it is, it is a funny scene. I think the thing that keeps it good is what you mentioned that Indy and short round have their own little story happening. Yeah. Like between the two of them. And I love that. I love that short round cheats at cards. Yeah. Like he's this yeah. little kid, but he already knows how to cheat at cards. <laughs> yeah. I mean, their little story and, there is awesome. Well, his in his moral outrage. First of all, Indy's cheating, and he's yes. an adult, and this kid's a kid, and he's like, "Oh, they were stuck together." And he's like, "No, you cheat, you cheat, you cheat." And then he says, "What is this?" And there's an ace of a sleeper. They're both cheating each other. It's it's great. It says yeah. a lot about the relationship, who they are, and I think it could have been less cartoony if it wasn't so like the bat, like spread wings and. You know, like if it was more thing like her just screaming, you know, and just c- encountering all this stuff. But I thought that that worked well. It it loses me when the snake gets on her and she throws it like thinking it's the elephant. I'm like, does she think she just f- somersaulted this elephant across the jungle? <laughs> 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 because she slings that snake and she's like there. But I do love the consistency because Harrison Ford isn't uh, Indy isn't scared of shit. But when he sees that snake, you, you see him like a couple yep. up and she throws it and he's like this. And it's like, I love the consistency because this is before his snake pit thing, you know? Yep. So he's still completely terrified of snakes. He's terrified of snakes. Yeah. And they found a way to do a different. So in the, in the, in Raiders, snakes were the creepy crawly of the movie, right? You know, whenever, whenever we needed Indy to be terrified, it, snakes showed up. So what I what I liked about this one is they what they did with this one is it was bugs and he's not he's not scared of bugs he didn't give a fuck yeah. about bugs right right like she's freaking out because there's bugs crawling all over her. he's like ah it's right. just a few bugs who cares yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's just figuring out 
So they get to Pancock Palace. Before we before we get to the dinner scene, why does Short Round have Indy's razor? <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever wonder that? You remember because he's he's in the palace and he and he's like Short Round, and it's just voiceover. It's like like what in post production were they like? You know what? We need we need Indy screaming for his razor here. Like I wonder, like what purpose does that serve? I wonder. I, what I assumed is that Short Round shaves him. Yeah. So. I've, I've always, even as a kid, I wondered that because there's a scene where they come out and it's this beautiful matte painting of Pancock Palace. And you hear Harrison go, short round, where's my razor? <laughs> and I'm just always like, why? What, because short what? round shaves him. Okay, but do we, do, how does that, sir, where, where does that come from? Where does that, sir, do they, is that scripted? Is that something they do no, in post? No, that was definitely, that's definitely some ADR shit that and they then, did. Well, couldn't we have been like more clever? You know, couldn't it have been something? Anyway, that's just something there. <laughs> well, now, and my and and my argument is that the weakness of this movie compared to the other two is in the script. Um, and th- and by the way, this is one that um, Lawrence Kansden didn't write because he didn't agree with the story, and he brought in the writers that did American Graffiti and uh, that did Howard the Duck, um, who's worked with Lucas in the past. So this is kind of a different. Different writers writing on this. Did Lawrence Kasdan come back for Crusade, I wonder? You know? I don't remember. I don't remember okay. if he was we'll there. We'll figure that out. Joseph will get to the bottom of that. So now let's talk about the dinner scene. Now, you've just flipped my mind with the dinner scene because I'm a horror fan. And I see this scene as like you go to, you know, you go to dinner. Everything, you know, seems nice. Oh, you smell the food cooking in the back. And then something is very, very wrong. And yeah. What I thought everybody at that table was a part of this cult. And I thought that there was this British dignitary that was showing up and Harrison Ford happens to show up. So they're all putting on a show to show like, oh, yeah, we're normal. We're completely normal. Then the dinner shows that, no, 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 these are not normal people. Something is something is really wrong with them. Well, I mean, because what, because they're all under that blood, that blood. Uh, you don't see them. Spell. The movie doesn't tell you that they're all part of the, the thuggy cult. Because we don't see them later. None of those people that were at the dinner are in any of the movie later when the cult's doing stuff. So, I mean, my, my assumption is that they're not all part of the thuggy cult. They certainly don't, don't tell you that they are. I think it would have been a better movie because it's striking when you see the guy that introduces himself to Indiana Jones and he's heard him. That, you know, it's striking when you see him because he's so dressed, you know, so clean, you know, so, and it, when you see him dressed in like, being a part of the cult is striking. So, well, but tonally though, so what they're going for in the scene is not horror. The tone of the scene is comedy. It's not horror. It is played as look at these ridiculous things that these people are eating and Indy's discomfort and Kate Capshaw's discomfort. And it, it's, it's definitely played as a comedy scene. Right. So the scene you're describing would be more of a horror scene, but that is not the tone of the scene at all. You know, it's interesting because I understand what you're saying about the tone being problematic because as a kid, it, this was horrifying to me. Yeah. When they bring the monkey heads and they pull oh, the Oh, yeah, head, the monkey the, heads are the worst. And, and th- th- it's an actual monkey head and they pull the top of his skull off. Like, that, yeah. was, that scared the shit out of me. Yeah. But I think Cape Cadshaw's reaction to it was very comedic. But what they were doing and how comfortable they were with eating snakes out of the, Like, that was... That is, I mean, the snakes, crawl, the, the little babies, grow, crawl, snakes crawling out of the other. I mean, that was, that's horror. That's some spooky shit. As much as I find this scene troublesome, it does have, the, to me, the funniest line in the whole movie, which is when he offers the plate of cockroaches to Kate Capshaw. And she goes, no, thanks. I had bugs for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, so what did you think a little bit of the back and forth when Harrison goes, I'm going to go. And I love that little moment between him and Short Round. He's like, I'm going to go check on Willie. And, he, and he's like, that better be all you're doing. You remember when he said that? And then he goes, tell me how it goes. And he goes, get out of here. Like, Harris Ford's like, get out of here. I'm not going to tell you how it goes. That was a great moment there. So she, he goes there to deliver the fruit. They have their little kiss, their little, you know, thing. I thought it was pretty, like, again, most of it I don't like every now and then the, the like the oh you'll be back in five minutes so like, yeah watch me and, <laughs> like, no that, that that actually that sequence between the two of them I think is the best scene the two of them have which is the whole they, they're each waiting 
for the other one to show up. I think that one is really well done where it's like, you know, she's tapping her foot and he's looking at his watch and yeah, you know, so well done. And he's like, he's not coming. She's not coming. But Harrison Ford is just such a great screen actor and his timing when, when they kiss and then, you know, it's clear they're going to bed and then she says, I might be the best you ever have or something like that. And then he goes into Playboy. He turns around, right? And he's, and he's closing the doors and he's like, well, we'll see. You know, <laughs> and he shuts the door and she's like, motherfucker. She pushes the door out. But like that transition from an actor to be like, to it's almost like, oh yeah, I've got, he's used to like, okay, I did, you know, okay, I've got you. It's a foregone conclusion. The momentum's going my way. So I can kind of do whatever I want to do now. And he goes like, okay, like this is something I've done 150 times. He goes to the door and she's like, "Uh uh-uh, like I'm not one of those. Um, That was really, that was a great scene and really well done. He was driving to the hole and and she came up for a monster block. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So the whole five minute thing worked. Now, when he gets attacked by the palace guard and he fucking hangs him, from a yeah. ceiling fan. Oh no, there's just murder like crazy in this movie. There's just murder after Dude. murder. Now that is a straight up cold blooded dark. Yeah. Darker than anything. Cause again, you got this 1930s razzmatazz between, you know, I'll be back in five minutes, this little yeah. silly comedy. And then he, like, ha- this guy's hanging and spinning around in the fan. Yeah, um, <laughs> just leaves him up there. <laughs> just leaves him up there, and it's yeah. like Spielberg. What the hell was? What mood were you in? Well, shooting that's, this movie. That's why this movie is so weird to me, because the tones keep clashing. Right there's like we have this silly scene between Willie and and Indy that's all about sexual tension and is played for comedy and and romance and sexiness and. Then we have Indy hang a dude from her fan and just leave him there. It's such a tonal like head fake. Yeah, it's it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes short round, turn off the fan. <laughs> like, what is the point of that? <laughs> um, yeah. And well, then- <laughs> we don't want that guy banging around. Like, we'll just leave him yeah. hanging, but we don't want him banging into yeah. stuff. So then he he brutally murders this guy hanging from a fan. And then he jumps right back into Rasmataz because he comes in and he's looking to see if there's anybody there to kill her. Yeah. And she thinks that he's in to get frisky. And so she's like, I'm right here. I'm right. And he's like looking around and she's like following around. Well, and, the, and then the comic moment where he grabs the statue's boobs. Yeah. Then he grabs and she's like, hey, what's wrong with me? <laughs> but and this is again, this is a great staging by Spielberg because a lot of the comedy comes from where the camera is. And when Harrison pops his head up around bed or when he's walking a red, around the bed, it, his, his face, he lands and hits his mark right in between the sheets. And she's behind him. And she's like, I'm right here. And he kind of looks at her like he's just not interested and like kind of going. So um, it's just a well-crafted, well-constructed scene. And a lot of the comedy comes from the camera movement uh, and, what, and what it is they do. As we discussed earlier, Spielberg does not know how to shoot a bad scene. He doesn't know how to do it. Even when the script isn't, the best and even when and you know the tonal things are bouncing all over the place spielberg just fucking knows how to shoot a movie he just knows how to do it it's like in his dna somehow i've never watched a spielberg movie and been bored yeah you know i I, that's one i mean like and most of the time i'm like over the moon happy with my experience at the very least if spielberg is you know in a slump at the very least it's like that was a very entertaining movie that's, that's that's the worst Spielberg's got, you know. I've never watched one of his movies and go, "Ugh, that was a terrible shot." What was he trying to do there? And almost ever, almost every other director, like even if ones I really like, you're watching, you're like, "I wonder what they were trying to accomplish there," because that that was a weird shot. I don't understand what they were trying to do. There's very few directors with that I watch where I'm just like, every shot is just a fucking painting. I think probably one of my favorite scenes is this is when short round they're in that uh, the passageway and short round leans up against the wall and it open and, and it creates a booby trap where the, where the ceiling is closing in on him. Yeah. And he's trying to get Willie to come in and save him. And he, and she's like, there's two dead people. And he goes, there's going to be two dead people in here. Yeah. And you see his face in the thing and he's so <laughs> pissed. And then the spikes are coming down on his hat. Well, and then, so, she, uh, and then she has to reach past the bugs, which, you know, uh, as a kid, now I've never liked bugs. I, I, bugs are not my favorite thing. 
And as a, as a kid, as a teenager, or a, gosh, I don't know what was I 12, 13 when I saw this movie, something like that. Like the idea of reaching my hand in past all those centipedes and millipedes and all that other shit to pull that lever. I remember thinking that person's probably going to die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> gonna be like, you got to pull the lever. You got to reach past the millipede to pull the lever. I'm like, <laughs> I think, I think you're going to die. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's the tie in that guy movie i'm trapped in a in a in a, in a and the walls are closing i'm like ty <laughs> like dude there's, there's a lizard millipedes you know, in there. there's I'm millipedes, not millipedes. In there. yeah i'm yeah. not into mill- sorry bro listen yeah. you had a great life you got kids you, were, you the you movie is the movie <laughs> the movie is you just trying to give me comfort yeah because i'm had, going you to had die a good run, buddy. because there's too many centipedes yeah. you got some <laughs> success <laughs> yeah you had some success yeah. you got a wife who loves you you got two good kids yeah, and we have, uh, you know, record breaking, most successful podcast that's ever existed of all You're time. Doing okay, of all time. Yeah, the all time successful. I believe we won the Academy Award time. for best podcast ever. I think we did. I think in the way that the best podcast ever Academy Award works is they just give one award one time. Like it's not a new. It's not every no, no, year. It's, it's not like, an annual thing. <laughs> no, they're just like yeah. you have won the Academy Award for best podcast of all time for life. Here's your F. award. Yeah, it it, it it extends in both directions throughout time to infinity. <laughs> to infinity. We yep. were the be- we were the number one podcast in the nineteen thirties. Yes. People didn't know that. And then to me, it doesn't feel like there's a third act. It feels like it's the second act, they get to the temple and it's just balls to the fucking wall. The damn the 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 hammer is down and we yep. are not stopping until the end because it is all temple and it does not stop. No matter how much I think a lot of the early scenes have this weird tonal mix and some unpleasant ethnic and gender politics going on in the earlier scenes, once we get into the temple, once the actual temple of doom becomes the setting, the movie is awesome from there on out. It's just nonstop awesome, right? The fights are great. The the holy shit, the minecart scene where they're escaping on the minecart yeah. and and all that crap. But the evil is real. And the I mean, evil is real. You're true. The stakes are high. You the are afraid are high. for them. And when the guy, when they're watching this ritual and he reaches in and pulls this guy's fucking heart out of his chest. Yeah. And, the, and then the, the heart, the, the chest closes back up and he's still alive. Yep. And then they, if that's not enough, let's throw him into molten lava and burn him and his heart. And his heart catches on fire in the dude's hand. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, there's some creepy shit going on there. There is some creepy shit. Like Spielberg and Lucas are there. Yeah. This is a a perfect time for somebody to say, I'm a reasonable man, but I seem some unreasonable (laughs) shit. Reasonable shit. (laughs) (laughs) Now that we saw the ritual, this is when temple of doom in terms of action sequences I think it competes with The Last Crusade. Now, it doesn't compete with The the Raiders of the Lost Ark, but in terms of just pure action sequence after action sequence after action sequence and having a really interesting, because you got fucking voodoo dolls, you know, drinking, they're forcing them to drink this blood out of a skull. And shout out to Harrison Ford, possessed by the devil acting, because when he's laying at the altar and he just drinks that blood, he's like... (laughs) <laughs> he's like knocking candles off like that's horror that's true that is straight horror and now he's mind controlled by whatever by kali ma and he's like he has that and he he, he raises up into the light and he's like <laughs> and starts laughing you're like jesus christ so the the evolution of how the the fear of the of this happening and he takes willie and puts her in the cage and locks the door and she's like who are you? And he's just like, he's not here. So you have Indiana Jones, who's been the hero that you can rely on, that you can trust. And you've, you've seen the first movie, you've seen the second movie. To see him turn and be evil like that, it's really dissettling. Yeah. I remember when I was, why, when I watched it the first time as a kid, I think that was the most unsettling. You know, you were talking about how the, the unsettling part for you was the, you know, the monkey brains and all that stuff. And that was pretty unsettling too for me. But, but the, the idea that you could be given this blood and you would lose your will to this guy and he would just control you from that. I've I've always, anything that takes control of your mind freaks me out. So this scene was like, this was the freaky scene for me. And like, I remember thinking like, Oh, he has to be faking. Like he has to be faking and he's going to like reveal that he was faking, but no, he's not. Yeah. You thought he was faking until he slapped the shit out of short round. 
<laughs> and that that traumatized me. That's when I was out, you know, because I was I loved Short Round and I was so, you know, as a kid, I was like seeing the movie through his eyes and I thought he was so cool and being on an adventure with Indy and he was somebody that Indy could count on. Yeah. He wasn't like a kid that Indy had to it was somebody like he saved Indy multiple times through yeah. that movie. And it was it was he was a worthy partner to have. So like as a kid watching them, that was so empowering. And when he backhanded short round, that fucked me up a little bit. When you when you were a little kid, you didn't want to get uh, backhanded by Indiana Jones. No, no I mean I would have <laughs> taken it. I I would taken a backhand to be able to go on an adventure with him. But uh, yeah, yeah, he slapped, it's it's that white fan moment again, you know. Yeah. But he he slapped the shit out of uh, short round, and short round burns him. Now. Yep. There was a deleted scene where there's a, a guard that gets burned and Short Round sees that and he comes to his senses and he realizes that he was in this deep, dark sleep. Mm. And so that's how Short Round knew that the fire would set him free. Yeah. But they deleted that scene. So I wonder, I don't, I don't remember bumping. I don't, I don't it, think it, they needed it. Like yeah. I, I, when, you, when you watch it, you know, the theatrical cut, I don't think anybody questions why that worked. Like in the moment, it just makes sense. You know, he got, got burned on the stomach with the, with the torch, comes to his senses. Like in the moment, it just works. I, I'm, I'm sure that that was a scene that they thought they needed at the script stage. And then when they shot it all and they were cutting it together, Spielberg was like, yeah, we don't need it. You know, that's the thing with, with editing and with this kind of story is once you're into the third act, once all the action is happening, it really is like running downhill. And anything that slows you down or could trip you up, you just got to get it out of there. You just got to get rid of it. You just, you're, you're running downhill. You just want to keep maximum speed going. Don't do anything that breaks the tension. Don't do anything that breaks the flow of it. And so scenes like this where they're like, Here, oh, here's an explanation of why this thing works. If you can get rid of it, you just get rid of it. Just because it just, it's just interrupting the flow of what's happening. We just want to keep running downhill as fast as we can. And, and, and that's exactly what they're doing because from here on out, you don't get a breath. Yep. And like that, the, the coal cart sequence is fucking phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, so much fun, so enjoyable. And the, yep. you know, and, and when they, when they make that jump over the thing and, and as you said, you know, when he's like trying to slow it down and his feet are burning and he's like, I need water, I need water. And then the thing opens up and the giant wall of water is chasing them, you know, building up to that massive crescendo of, they get out, get around the sides, and then that blast of, you know, that huge blast of water shooting out of the hole behind and, them. And I mean, because I'm conditioned, I remember watching it today, and I'm conditioning when they finish the, the, the cart ride, and he's like, water, water. And you, you think, oh, this is my moment where I can catch my breath. This is the moment yeah. where I can cool down. And, 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 but no, this, no, the big wall of water comes, it busts right through. And then as they're, as they're transitioning to the bridge, there's still adventures to be had before you get to the bridge, the last like set piece. And he's, they're still having to fight these guys. And they do two callbacks in a row. They do the, the first Indy callback when he reaches for his gun and it's not there. Yep. And then they do the Han Solo callback when he's like, ah, and he chases him away. And then he stops and he's like, and his eyes get big. And then he turns around and run. And then they just yep. all like a ton of them run. Around. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So and it has, and like, the sequence on the bridge is great. Oh. Uh, like it, all this stuff builds it builds up to like I mean it's a, it's a, it is a great 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 third act it is just nonstop action once you get to the temple the movie never lets up and I I think it's really creative that you're fighting on a on a bridge over this huge chasm yep. and at the bottom of that bridge in the rivers is just full of gators or crocodiles or whatever yeah and. Yeah, because like, cause like the 80-foot fall wouldn't kill you, so you need some crocodiles <laughs> to chew on you, too. Through. <laughs> and Indiana Jones don't give a shit, man. Like, so when he's, when he's cornered, he starts cutting the things because it's his only way to escape, and then he's yeah. got to fight his way up through the ladder, and then he has the showdown with the main guy, the main villain, and that guy pulls out his old magic trick, and he's like trying to rip his heart out, <laughs> hanging from a ladder, over a river full of crocodiles that are just that are like literally like every time I cuss them, the crocodiles are looking up like yep. just wanting them to fall. <laughs> just wait. Well, and you see other guys fall, and the crocodiles are like rolling with them in the oh, water. They're and rolling shit. and ripping shit and yeah. everything like that. It's uh, dark, man. You hit that water, you're having a bad day. <laughs> it's dark, man. Yeah, if you survive the fall, 
Those yeah, crocodiles you, are king. You really want to hope that the fall kills you. So he brings the rock back. He saves the day. And uh, and then he gives Cape Capshaw a kiss after he, he cuts her in half with the bullwhip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Like, I, yeah. I don't think that's pleasant. I don't think getting grabbed with a bullwhip is pleasant. All right. Well, that's our Temple of Doom. I'm actually pleasantly surprised, Ty. I did not. I think it was probably Brett or Brett or maybe our uh, dipshit producer that we, I would have these debates about Temple of Doom on. But a lot of my movie nerd friends will just bash Temple of Doom. Yeah. But you, you also hang out with, like, stuck-up people who, like, try to prove that they're smart by loving French cinema, so. Yeah, true. Yeah, fuck those um, guys. Yeah, fuck those guys. Yeah, uh, a, a, anybody so, who does not immediately agree that Die Hard is the greatest movie ever made, they, they, yeah, they that's I can't your, talk movies with them. You know in Blade Runner when you can do a test to tell yeah, if somebody is like a comp. droid? <laughs> yeah, that's the way That's comp. the test. Yeah. <laughs> you sit down and you ask them a question. What do you think about Temple of Doom? And then the very last one is like, is, is Die Hard the greatest movie ever made across all time and space? And if they say no... You just you know them. that they're they're just not good them. people. You're like, well, yeah, you're not. You're you're, yeah, you're a replicant. Pro- <laughs> I got to retire <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, they're and they're horrible. They're horrible people. They have no morality. Yeah. They have no sense of self. They have no internal sense of goodness. They have to no them. ethical framework. No ethical they have no, framework. They have no dignity. No humanity. Yeah, I hate those. Yeah, you got to. You just got to retire them at that point. You just retire them. All right. What's the top five, man? What's our top five, Joseph? The list for today is top traumatic PG films. Oh yeah, that's right. Be, because this is the um, pre PG thirteen era. Because uh, Spielberg kept pushing the limit on what he could get away with with these PG movies, and I think he pretty much single handedly is the reason the PG thirteen rating exists. Well, he is. I mean, he's the one who actually, like, he's the actual guy that suggested it to them and made that happen. And that, I mean, do you talk about a flex? <laughs> like, you know what? How about let's just make another category to that my movies can be in? That my movies can be in. <laughs> so it's not going to be rated no, R. Let's just call this uh, PG Spielberg. Yeah. I wish this is actually a really good top five because there's, that would be fun to see, like, to go back and see what P- PG movies got away with being PG, like push the limit so much that got away being, being PG. <laughs> I think like Red Dawn was the first PG-13 movie, but that would be number one if that movie <laughs> would have made PG and it wasn't PG-13. So the list we got, so Joseph did send us a list. His top traumatic PG films pre-PG-13 on Joseph's list is Temple of Doom, obviously. Poltergeist, which I agree. <gasps> Pol- You're kidding. Poltergeist is PG. Poltergeist is PG. Uh, how yep. did he pull that off? Gremlins. I can see that. Now, e- I, I, don't, I don't agree with E.T. I don't think E.T. would be PG-13 Not today. at all. I think, I think it's still PG. Yeah, uh, that's Willy PG. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Um, that's PG. Yeah, that's pretty PG. Uh, I would G- like to state traumatic PG <laughs> films. Jaws. Was Jaws PG? Crazy as it sounds, Jaws was PG. Dude, oh my God. Spielberg, Spielberg got away with murder. Holy shit. I, 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 I had always thought Jaws was R because Jaws got some boobies in it. It's got some people get being bitten half by sharks. Man, I had no idea. How did he pull that off? How did he get away with that shit? Yeah. Um, invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yeah, that, that's, pretty, that's a pretty traumatic Which PG. Which one? I'm talking, I think we're talking the Donner, Donald Sutherland one. The yeah. Donald Sutherland? There's boobies all in that movie. Yeah. Uh, That's tw- PG? Yeah. It's a different yeah, time, get, man. You could get away with a lot in PG back in those days. Twilight Zone, the movie. Um, that was, there were some traumatic moments in that movie. It's, it, it's, again, it's a weird tonal mix. It's kind of a tonal mess, which is why I don't think the yeah. movie did that well. But there's some sequences in there that are pretty dark. Um, right. something, something wicked this way comes. I agree. Something wicked this way comes. That movie is dark and that movie's uh, dark. And I love it. I love it. I, I, read I that love book. it too. I love that over movie. and over Ray Bradbury. I need to rewatch God, it. I, I was actually movie. talking to my wife about that movie recently and it made me remember that I need to rewatch it. Uh, Watership down. I don't know. Watership down is just PG, but you know, it is kind of depressing when the bunnies get killed. Uh, then he's got dark crystal. I mean that, that was some, there's oh some, my God. Some, there was some dark stuff in there. It is definitely it's some PG. Scary, there's some scary it's stuff. Some sca- yeah. yeah, there's some scary shit. You know yeah. what's interesting is that... Go ahead. 
Oh, yeah, I was going to say the last one that he's got here, and I, this has to just be for the trauma of his never-ending story. The, the, the traumatic bit is when the horse dies. Yeah. But it's still, it's still pretty PG. Dude, I love this top five. This is a great top five. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for some other. Dude, for me, traumatized poltergeist scared the shit out of me. And talk about oh, yeah. the many, many talents yep. of Steven Spielberg. You know, people talk about for him to produce a horror movie like that. That is, I mean, that movie is really, really good. You know, did you watch The Rats of Nim when you were young? Oh, of course. That movie fucked me up. Secret, there was some scary well, the movie's shit. called Secret of Nim. Oh, the, the book Secret is of Nim. Rats of Nim. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, The Secret <laughs> of Nim. You think that belongs on the list? It was pretty intense. So just for the sake of. Not making this be two hours. Okay, so do we agree Poltergeist is number one? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine with Poltergeist. I say Jaws number two. I, and, and you could, it, Jaws and Poltergeist, like, to me, they're the same. You could put either of them in the number one yeah. spot. But again, though, I, I think, like, if we're looking at it from a subjective personal experience, yeah. my experience with Poltergeist was way more terrifying than Jaws. I love, Jaws is one of my favorite movies ever, but it didn't scare me the way Poltergeist scared me. Yeah. Poltergeist fucked me up. Uh, and then, obviously, Something Wicked What This Way Comes. So I think we're at three now. I, I, I also feel like we're, we're kind of ignoring Gremlins here. Gremlins was pretty fucking dark. Yeah, it gets dark. And I, and I, watch, I, I, show, you know, I show my kids, and I got to stop right at the, the gremlin in the cage that kills the, the, the teacher at school. Yeah. That's where I got to stop. Yeah, Gremlins gets pretty dark. I, I, but it didn't affect me, so I guess I don't see it that way. As a PG movie, it is a surprisingly dark and gory movie. You know, originally, the, the dog that they hung up by the Christmas lights, in the script, it was like the dog was killed and like, in hanging by its neck from the Christmas lights. <laughs> that's some dark shit. Yep. Or maybe that's the thing that was keeping out of PG, so they had to, they had to twist it. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Poltergeist, Jaws. Uh, something wicked this way comes. Gremlins. In Rats of Nim. Sure, I'd I'd go Secret of Nim. Secret of Nim has some pretty dark shit in it for a PG cartoon. Man, you got me thinking about Poltergeist. I want to go and watch it. Okay, so let's <laughs> do uh, Secret of Nim to be the last one on the list. Yep. We should do a dive on Poltergeist because there's something in the DNA of that movie that I can't shake. You know, it affects Joseph like that too. You know, I remember yep. my sister was affected. Like, there's something about it, but you can't stop watching it. It's so good. Thank you guys for hanging out. Please like and subscribe and ring that little bell because every time you do it, Ty gets his horns. We love you guys. We miss you. And we look forward to seeing you next week. And if you have any ideas of what you would like us to talk about, please let, let us know. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.